everybody. This is David here from Team Powerhouse, Cobal Banker, the PowerCast live with Eric and myself. We are live in California with a very special individual, my brother-in-law, PK. How you doing, man? Thank you so much for being with us you today. You sound very radio today. I feel radio. Good morning and welcome to <laughs> David Lamar's podcast. He does that every time, PK. Oh, my goodness. As, and as the questions or things are, people coming live on the show, they're coming on as you can see them joining. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us here today. Very excited to have you. Having a very special individual, as you know, PK, the... Star and new. I'm not the star, David. <laughs> My wife is the star. Can she's, we make that very clear? She's definitely the star, but you're probably the newest and hottest fan favorite this year on the show. Would you well, say with that? Would you agree with that? Listen, the, the polls don't lie, David. It the, is what it is. The polls don't lie, and the reason is because you've taken five years. <laughs> you know what? It's five years in the coming, and five years of being behind Maurizio can really do something to your emotional <laughs> spirit. You know that. I just look at him every day and think, why? Why am I behind you? I love it. Oh, my goodness. All right. So we got a lot to talk about today. Um, let's talk about first question for you, being in the real estate game for many years. Yeah. How long ago did you get into this game? I started in real estate when I was 18 years old. Wow. Yeah. That's so I'm 54. So it's 28, 38, 48, 36 years ago. What would you say is the largest real estate deal you've done? Largest in terms of? Capital cost, the most pricey, largest in terms of landfill size, Let's square go, footage. You've done deals in the sports arena. You've done deals and commercial. You've done it at home. Uh, and you're very involved and you have your hands in a lot of great things in addition to show business. How about, let's go with the homes. All right. So the largest real estate transaction I was ever involved with was the acquisition of a public company. Stop two hours before the stock exchange announcement. So let's just treat it as it did go through. Because okay. everything that was involved yes. and needed to be involved, that was for 650 million sterling, which at the time was 1.2 billion. Wow. Um, and that was the acquisition. <laughs> that was the acquisition of a house builder. The largest single transaction I did on a building was I bought a building in Madison Avenue, New York, okay. which ironically your sister was a tenant in. Yeah. I didn't even know. Yeah. And that's another story I'll tell you about that. But that was 256,000 square feet of office and retail on the corner of Madison Avenue and 34th. And I paid 106 million for it. Wow. So that was the single biggest single acquisition I did. Okay. But then I bought another couple of buildings in Fifth Avenue that cumulatively were more. They were 160 million, but they were two buildings. So 80 and 80. So I don't know if they win. Uh, That's up to you, David. I, you're I, you're I, in charge. I would call that a win when you have two buildings for 80 million apiece. I would call that a win okay. all day long for sure. Um, you've also been involved in the sports arena football. Yeah. And football, what we call America soccer but we're going to call it football as it's supposed to be called as it's supposed to be and um you definitely tell us a little about your in 2001 i fulfilled a childhood dream and became the vice chairman of tottenham hotspur football club which is a premier league football club uh i think it's in the top 10 sports franchises in the world i was a season ticket holder i was the kid on the terrace and through a series of really unusual events I ended up in business with the majority shareholder. I joined the board in 2001. I was part of that original acquisition and I stayed there for seven or eight years until I moved to America. Wow. Um, so that was pretty much a dream. I mean, I guess for you, it's you, what, what baseball team is your team? Uh, I'm a Yankees fan. I'm so <laughs> it's a Yankees perfect example. It's like you being a Yankees fan and suddenly you're in the director's box making decisions about the Yankees. Right. That's so, it. yeah, that was pretty much a, a, a big thing. Unbelievable. Mm. Eric, uh, I know you're back in the studio over there um, and uh, have a couple of questions for PK as well. Um, anything you want to throw at PK over here? Uh, no. I, I, um, I, what, 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 I, what I did when I did my research, PK, what I did see is it, it labeled you as chairman of Revive Cosmos. So, um uh, I want yeah. to thank when, you I about left, that. when I left for um, America in 2009, 
I went and bought the intellectual property rights of the original Galacticos team, the New York Cosmos. Wow. I also um, re-employed Pele and then became Pele's manager. We put a, a legend called Eric Cantona, who anybody watching this knows anything about soccer or football will know who that is. He's um, Man United's all-time great player, certainly one of them. Um, and a real character, a real enigmatic, amazing guy, manager. And we set about reforming the New York Cosmos with a view to taking a franchise in the MLS. Wow. We only played one game. We played it against Manchester United. Uh, to, a, to a sold out crowd, it was amazing 80,000. And then, um, some friendly people from the Middle East came and wanted to buy it, so uh, I sold it. And that's probably a good sale, right there. It was a good sale, it was the whole, the whole <laughs> thing was a great 18 months. I mean, I, I obviously stayed on with Pele for a long time after that, I stayed as Pele's uh, manager for the best part of seven or eight years after that. Let's talk about Pele for Maybe a minute. Maybe even longer. Let's just talk about Pele for a minute because mm. you also made a movie on Pele. I did. Which uh, was unbelievable. On a personal, did you say it? I did. A personal and emotional and character level. Uh, want to talk about that? Yeah. Listen, when you make a movie, I'm, I'm just in the process of making another one now. I'm doing the Boy George movie. Wow, uh, which is a, exciting. Yeah, it's a bigger budget. It's think Bohemian Rhapsody, think Rocket Man. But the Pele movie was really a, a, a passion project for me. I did it with the amazing Brian Grazer, the Oscar winning producer and Imagine Films. And we told the story of how Pele grew up in the favelas, very poor and became the youngest ever winner of a World Cup. That's the story. It's based around the 1958 Swedish World Cup. Obviously he went on to win three more World Cups and become the best ever. Um, but, but we cover a period of his life where his father, it's actually all about a, a promise that Pele made. So when Pele was, I want to say he must have been eight or nine, and he saw Brazil lose the final to Uruguay. He was contradict me, Bowman, but I think it was Uruguay. <laughs> and he saw his father cry and wow. he says to his father, Dad, I will win a World Cup for you. That's... And that's the story and, it was and the reality. Very emotional. I mean, obviously, I've rolled with Pele for a long time now. He knows your sister. He knows Jagger. He knows Phoenix. He's been Very part well. of our lives. And my father. And your dad. Yeah, got to meet him. And, it, you know, you go when you travel with him, it's like traveling with... Um, Michael Jackson. No, a head of state. Right. It's like going with a head of state. That's when, wherever we go, we meet leaders, prime ministers, kings, queens, emperors. It's, it's, it's an amazing spectacle to see. Amazing. And he's the nicest, sweetest man. Very good waiver. <laughs> Very good waiver. Waves like that. Let's go into the Boy George movie. That was actually a little teaser right there you kind of threw out there. I mean, I'm sure that the people would love to know more about that. If you can, touch on a couple of things over there. Tell me sure. So we... we um, by, the, by the way, I was just going to interrupt one second. I met Boy George. One of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. Such a soft-spoken, intimate guy who just is very warm, friendly, and outgoing. Go ahead. I'm sorry. The uh, no, it's no problem. It's your it's your thing. Do you want to uh, carry on? We have some questions. Uh, no, I haven't answered that one yet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Eric, he has not prepared for this podcast <laughs> at all. He's got not, nothing written down. Not one question. I do have questions. Really? You can ask a question. You haven't even that's allowed. Un, that's uncommon for him because he's usually. <laughs> yeah. well, literally, tell us all about the Boy George movie. Then let's go and look on your Instagram. And see who's asking <laughs> no. questions. So let me tell you about the Boy George movie. The script has been written by a, an amazing writer called Sasha Gervaisi, who is responsible for Hitchcock. Terminal. Uh, he was nominated for an Emmy a couple of years ago for a movie called A Dinner with Ave, which was about Ave from Fantasy Island. And that's an amazing movie. You should watch that. It's actually a true story about a journalist who went to interview Ave, and Ave decided to make the, the last two days of his life a suicide note. Wow. Through this journalist. The journalist happened to be Sasha, who's written our movie. Sasha was very plugged into the 80s music scene. He was the drummer of Bush originally. Right. Um, and we, we felt when we interviewed a number of writers that he was the one that could best portray George's story. And when he did the script and we read it, it was just mind-blowingly good. I mean, this, this movie, 
is going to be very, very special. It's going to, it's going to compete with Bohemia. Wow. That's exciting stuff. Um, it's amazing to have somebody in the chair with me today, not only being family, <clears throat> without getting emotional, um, who's done so much in the past 25, 30 years, let's start with that, or longer, in so many different industries, um, and so passionate about everything he does. And going to the Real Housewives over here, let's talk about that for a minute, being this year's most exciting, popular. Keep going, baby. <laughs> Keep going. Most exciting, popular guy in the show, because you know what? You, you're you very real. Best looking. Best looking. Charismatic. <laughs> I know. Stylish. Mauricio, Mauricio might get upset about this one here, but. <laughs> Who gives a <laughs> if Mauricio gets upset? <laughs> so he is uh, David, entertaining. David, he yes. was that controversial. And controversial. Exactly. The most controversial is guy. That your, is that your input for this podcast, <laughs> yeah. Eric? So far, yes, it is. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Um, I'm not controversial. I'm honest. That's right. And I'm British. And sometimes my sense of humor misses. And sometimes it doesn't. And hey, that's okay. I, I've got um, a lot of great fans that follow me in America and in the UK. They're each super, super popular and beautiful. And we roll together. So you know, the dynamic between her and me, I'm here to support her. This is her show, her and the ladies, you know, and they go on their journey and occasionally Maurizio and I are invited in <laughs> to participate and occasionally we're not and occasionally our opinions wanted, more often than not, <laughs> yeah, more often than not, not wanted. Um, but yeah, it's been part of our lives for five years now. We're on our, we just started um, filming season six for us which is season 12 so in fact the housewife as i affectionately refer to dorit is working today so she's doing her stuff that will be seen by millions and we're doing our stuff that will be seen by david's family <laughs> family friends and guests um greg said to have you all on the show over here again with us watching live on the show um please if you have any questions go ahead and reach out to us comment etc we're streaming live on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitch. Um, we missed something at all? Instagram, YouTube, Twitch, Facebook. Excellent. So, yeah, the movie's exciting, David, and um, we're feeling good about that. We start shooting in February. We haven't yet cast Boy George, um, and there will be some announcements out in relation to the casting of that movie Excellent. fairly soon. And with that, we also have something to talk about. You have a big thing that we're going to be talking about over here right now that's happening in the UK you're going to be starting a new show yeah that's very exciting so we are uh, fully green lit commissioned whatever term you do uh, we're going on channel 4 which is a major network in the UK and we have a reality show which is going to be based around my return to real estate in the UK um I am going into business with an amazing girl um, who has successfully built up her own agency. She's a single mum, and we're going to increase the team. We're going to move premises. We're going to rebrand, and we're going to explode it. And essentially, it will be a TV show following the lives of the people that come and work in our agency. You're going to see some of the nicest houses in the world, you know, it's super, super prime. I, I want to say it's Selling Sunset meets a number of other reality shows that you will know in America. It's um, the first show of its kind in the UK. We've got, as I say, we've got the support of a major network, so we're super excited about that. Wow. We'll try and persuade your sister to appear on it from time to time. Maybe she'll do the styling of the staff that are going to come to work for this <laughs> estate agents. And... That has been a project that, that, that I'm very passionate about. I'm very excited about. We start shooting in February. Wow. We would start sooner, but, you know, London gets dark very, very early these days. So it's difficult to show the real beautiful properties that we're going to show. And, um, you know, and it's going to be it's going to be quite a journey. I think it will be very funny. I think it'll be very emotional. I think it'll be aspirational, very glamorous. And... Um, 
Yeah, I'm excited about that. Tell us a little about the real estate in the UK. What are we talking about on pricing? Give me an idea what kind of a well, property we're looking at over here. Are you talking in relation to what we will handle or in relation in general? So the real estate market is very frothy in the UK. As long as interest remain, interest rates remain low and people are, uh, are scared about other industries, real estate is becoming a defensive industry. It's somewhere people want to put their money. Right. The kind of properties we're going to be dealing with are going to be amongst the most expensive in the UK. I mean, we're, we're going to be offering an apartment for sale, which is currently £175 million, pounds, which is $250 million. Wow. We've got houses Holy at moly. 50 $60, 70000000 million. Um, we'll, we will do a bit of commercial business. Um, but, yeah, our, our agency is going to be based in central London. Okay. Prime, prime central London. So I can't even tell you the address yet because I'm not allowed. But it's, it's what you'd call prime, prime. So... Um, yeah, everything we deal with, it will be a, a certain value and above. That's fantastic. Big stuff, stuff you'd love to get your hands on. Always. Uh, you know, when it comes to real estate, we get all different pieces of the puzzle. Sometimes one leads to another and building relationships as you've been doing for them years and years in many businesses. Um, it's all about relationship building and you're great at relationship building and networking with people. Um, and, you know, let's talk about how we got into the whole, you know, TV industry, how about that? Um, how did that kind of come about? How did that take off? Well, I've always been involved in media in some way, shape or form. I mean, you can't run a premiership soccer team without having relationships in media, be it the press, be it TV, etc. I was the guest judge for four seasons on the UK version of The Apprentice. Oh, wow. Where I was known as the aggressive uh, challenge for episode 11 of each season. So every, episode 11 of The Apprentice was basically, I think there was four candidates left and their task was to be interviewed by, and then I would give my recommendations along with two of my colleagues to the now Lord Sugar, the then Sir Alan Sugar. Um, and that was a lot of fun. And that got me used to sort of being in front of the camera. And when, when I came to LA, um, I mean, I'll let Dorit tell that story another another time, but needless to say, we made a decision that it would be a good idea for Dorit to join the cast of The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. I guess it still remains to be seen whether that was indeed a good idea. Um, you can ask me that on a weekly basis because I changed my mind. <laughs> um, this week, it was a bad idea and everybody watching knows why. And we are... Um, it's going to be remiss of me not to mention how Dorit's doing, but she's doing okay. She's going to work through this. She's an amazingly tough lady. And she absolutely, the way that she dealt with it um, makes me incredibly proud of her. And I, you know, I wasn't there that she saved. Well, I know she saved my, she saved my family and God bless her for that. She's incredible for uh, the kids. They, um, they know absolutely zero about this. And if I have my way, never will. So that's a summary of what I want to say in regards to that. Um, so if you ask me, is the Housewives a good idea? Obviously, no, not now. But we get a lot of joy out of the Housewives. We've um, made a lot of great friends. No secret that we're besties with Carl and Maurizio. And we love hanging with them. And all the ladies I'm close with, um, except for some of the newer ladies, um, but you know, I, I've enjoyed it. We've had, we get to go to nice parties. I get to see my wife dress up, look super glamorous. You know, yeah. I get to make a few <clears throat> bad jokes on TV. Yeah. It's, it's all good fun. It is good fun. And I'm trying not to cry over here because, uh, this whole thing that we're talking about, um, I flew to California as soon as I could to see this amazing family. It's a very good <sighs> uncle. Thank you. Very good uncle. Cries a lot. <laughs> cries a lot I mean it's funny I think that the uh, Dorit is not quite as prone to, to that kind of emotion as David is and I'm somewhere in between but you're, you're basically ridiculous David I mean <laughs> this is live on air I mean unless you're looking to like get some major sponsorship deal from some <laughs> I Kleenex glass company I, I would try and stop if, if I could. Absolutely. <laughs> try, and, try and pull yourself together, Dave. Where's that scotch we were talking about? My oh, I can go and make you one. Do you want one? 
We'll get one after for sure. Going to need one. Um, hey, Dave, can I interject with a question real quick? Please, please, Eric, jump in. PK, just a real yeah. quick question. So um, obviously the style of houses that are more popular here in the U.S., how do they go over over there in the U.K.? Well, the fundamental difference between the U.K. and the U.S. is obviously the fact that the U.S. has not got the history that the U.K. has got. You know, there are, there are houses and buildings that go back to the, you know, the 1400s, the 1300s and, and before. Um, through the period of, through the essence of time, there's been different architectural, you know, styles. So Georgian times produced Georgian houses, Victorian times produced Victorian houses. You, you know, that's, that's kind of how it works. So, you know, in central London, a lot of the real estate, the chunks of property are owned by age-old arist aristocratic um, aristocratic yeah that's the right word family so for example the Grosvenor estate they own the bulk of Mayfair the Portman estate owns the bulk of Fitzrovia um, and these estates are huge families that are I, I, I guess they're well the Grosvenor estate is uh, Lord Grosvenor who is a cousin of the Queen I believe then you've got the crown itself which is the crown. Yeah. They own billions of billions of dollars of real estate. Can we speak about the queen for one second? Sure. Have you met the queen? I have. Well, that's amazing. I have met the queen. Sorry. I have met the queen. I have met Prince Charles. And I met the late, um, God bless his soul, Duke of Edinburgh. That's just yeah. amazing. To sit with somebody who knows and has met someone. No, like I that. don't know them. No. Can we just okay. clarify <laughs> I met them. Met them. As it happens, I had dinner with the Duke of Edinburgh in Buckingham Palace. Wow. We had it in the China stateroom. Wow. And I'll share with your listeners a funny story because I was very nervous. I went through the main gates of Buckingham Palace, you know, up to the Chinese. It's called the Chinese room. And it's the Chinese room is the room that sits behind the balcony that you will have seen the royal family stand on when they wave to everybody, right, right. in the centre of the palace. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's called that is it, it's decorated. The wall coverings are all ancient Chinese art. Wow. And it's a very impressive room. And that was where the dinner was. And there was about 12 of us at the dinner. And I noticed, obviously, when the Duke of Edinburgh came in, I mean, how immaculate it was. The tie knot, you could have, you literally could see a reflection in his shoes. Everything was perfect. And I was super nervous. And there was cutlery going both sides of the table. And I want to say there might have been 18 people the cutlery either side <laughs> and, and the only little bit of etiquette I knew that you start at the end and you work it that much I knew so I started at the end and I was ready for my appetizer as you call it in America and in the royal household they serve the food on trays so the butlers come in and they present to you the tray yeah. and you're supposed to take the cutlery and you collect the food and you put it on your plate all sounds relatively simple, except if you're nervous and the first course is a mushroom volivon. And for those of you who don't know what a volivon is, it's a pastry cake, mushroom and a sauce in it. And when that's hot, it, it makes the pastry somewhat soft. So I picked up the volivon and I basically was going like this and it became very clear after about two seconds that I wasn't in fact going to make the plate, <laughs> right? Now bear in mind, everybody's looking at me. So I'm, I'm literally looking like I'm flying some plane. <laughs> um, and the butler leaned over and said, Mr. Kemsley, I said, he goes, would you like to put it back on the tray? So I went like that, put it back on the tray. He said, now put your cutlery down. Put my cutlery down. He said, now breathe. <laughs> yeah. I had a big breath. He said, and let's go again. So next time I managed to successfully transfer the mushroom to Bonavon. So why don't you tell me uh, a little bit about what you're doing and your aspirations for growing your business and how can I, as your brother-in-law, help? Wow, that's a very good question and much appreciated question. Uh, aspirations are to continue to make new contacts in real estate business to help grow our base, our team, our exposure, and to help uh, generate, to get to uh, obviously larger clientele, uh, financially listings and buyers. Um, 
in this business, as you know, it's all about building relationships. And the more you can know, understand who you are and trust who you are, the more they want to talk about certain people. And uh, obviously, we sell probably about 50 homes in there. I do. I think over 200 and change. Right. Um, so it's a matter of really getting to that next level of clientele. You know, looking to buy the one million, two million, three million, and sell those properties and so forth. In Connecticut, it's not like California, unfortunately, but fortunately, right? So in California here, you got this beautiful farmhouse colonial, which in Connecticut they don't have any homes like that. And it's amazing how different the real estate is in Connecticut and California and different parts of the state. Although Connecticut, for me, I've only been a couple of times. I went to meet your parents, mm -hmm. um, and we've been to a couple of family functions there. I loved it. It's so beautiful. The drive from Manhattan to where you live. Yeah. It's just like something out of a movie. The tree-lined streets is so pretty. I mean, I'm sure Greenwich, Connecticut, they've got multi, multi, multi-million dollar they do, homes, you they know? Do. You know what's interesting is that in, back in Connecticut, these larger homes do not sell as often, as opposed to, let's say here in California, where it's, an, it's a common number to be a three, four, five million dollar house yeah. compared to what it is in Connecticut. When Connecticut sells a house at three, four, five million dollars or greater, it's very common that you'll see it. It's exposed. It's much a bigger thing uh, than it is, let's say, in California. But obviously, I'd like to grow our, our brand and our team. And uh, we've got a great team. I got my right hand guy over there, Eric Vasquez, uh, in the studio, uh, which we've seen before over there. We've got uh, seven other agents of the team that are doing phenomenal, uh, getting better and better and better and stronger. Uh, we train together, we learn together, we go out together, and we love to uh, build our brand and work harder, you know? Anyway, we actually story. I've got more role stories, but you're not getting them all on this particular podcast. So you'll come back again? Oh, definitely. It's been, it's we have a question for David, actually. <laughs> we have, David, we have a question for you. Yes. Um, one of the people who um, came from PK's Instagram asks you, how long have you been in real estate? Thank you for asking. I've been 16 years in the business. Um, I started back in 05. Um, just uh, someone said to me, I was, I was working with my father in the family business. And someone said, listen, you've got a great personality. Uh, he was a mortgage broker. He said, listen, you should jump into real estate. And then I decided to take a shot at it. And in 05, the market was going up. And I took off like a bandit um, with building relationships. You know, people knew who I was. They had a relationship with me in the business my family had. So they felt comfortable calling me. And then I was out there knocking on doors, literally knocking on doors to meet people because that's how you did it back. And there was no social media back then. There was no Instagram, Facebook and all that kind of stuff. As a matter of fact, I never even used a computer back in the day because I didn't need to. You know, you're going to look for a map. You've clearly taken those habits with you into your current <laughs> With your current mode, you just don't use any about it. <laughs> just an iPhone and a, and a whiskey, and you're, you can do it, huh? you know. Definitely, uh, so 16 years in the business, and uh, you know, looking forward to the next 20 years having some fun doing this. And I appreciate that question, great question. Wasn't my question. Uh, who was the one that asked that question, by the way? Do you have a tag on there by chance? Uh, Dor um, Dory Kimsley fans. Excellent. Thank you very it's much. That fan me. page that you told me that you told me about. Uh, yeah, excellent question. Years. It was an excellent question. You know, I want to be legendary. I want to be legendary where people will know who I am, like my sister, well, like I, yourself. Hey, I, 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 you, you. First of all, you. That's not a great aspiration for people to know your name. What, what's a great aspiration is for you to become the number one at what you do most respected of what you do. And, and there are a lot of people who do that without people knowing their name. That's All true. of that said, yes, it's nice to be recognized. It's nice for people to know your name. There are two sides to being famous. There's two sides to being public. Right. Do you understand? Yes. I, I obviously have experienced both sides of that. And um, fortunately, the great bulk of fans are super sweet and lovely and Whenever people come up to either Dorit or me in the street, we've never had anyone come up and been anything other than fabulous and I love you and can we have a hug? Yes. Less of the hugging during COVID, but, you know, can we have a selfie? The hate that we see online, which you also have to be aware of, is from far and few between, if I'm honest. So 
it represents such a minute, a minute percentage of the fans of the Real Housewives. So, for example, Twitter is obviously a cesspit of disgusting violence. And yes. People come on and they just type away on their computers and they could be, you know, if you look on them, they don't have a profile. They could be a cat, a dog. It's going to be some <laughs> true. weirdo. It's true. The, the, the people that I think are more dangerous yes. are the people that actually have regular potentially good jobs and hide behind aliases just in order to create rumor, start rumor, be mm -hmm. hurtful and, and make people feel bad. And I'm now at a stage where I've decided to start calling some of those out. Um, and that is what I'm going to do. And some of those people who've been relentlessly vile about my family made up all sorts of stories. You know what? It's going to be their time to shine and be well known. So I always warn you when Love you say it. I want to be Love legendary it. and people recognize me, be that, but be that for the right reasons. When I Do you say, understand? Let yeah, me celebrate absolutely. you. Like some of my pals that are famous. I mean, my best mate is Robbie King. Yes. One of the greatest soccer players, you know, of the last 20 years. And, you know, he's well known for being brilliant at what he does or what he did. That's how you want to be well known. Be well known for being brilliant. If you can't be well known like me for being good looking, funny, charismatic, <laughs> and all the other, you know, I'm just making that point. Right. David, I we have another question for you. Excellent. Um, what services do you offer and in what areas? So we cover all services of real estate needed uh, residential, commercial. Uh, we do leasing, we do all types of res uh, real estate needs and wants. We cover the state of Connecticut. And if anybody's ever going outside the state, we can assist them in that aspect as well. So we appreciate that's a great question. Um, we do a lot more residential than commercial. Uh, with the market has changed. Uh, we did more. We did a lot of commercial before, but definitely more residential now. Um, I also think one of the things that David does that not many agents do, not many brokers. David invests his time and interest in the actual family. So as opposed to just selling them a house and saying, sign, 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 he'll really sit with them, get to know them. So he understands what will work for them. I've seen him tell someone not to do a deal because it doesn't make sense for them, even though he would be making his money. He plays a longer game and he enjoys building those relationships. And if someone comes to him and says, find me a house, um, he will take the time to really understand what they want. And the same when it comes to selling. You know, he'll walk in and he won't be frightened about saying, look, I think we need to change that room or we need to change this. And he brings much more than just, I'm going to advertise your house and I'm going to sell it. I've seen you very invested with your with your customer. I, PK, you hit nail on the head. Thank you so much for saying that. It's absolutely the truth. It's all about, again, building the intimate relationship with the client. And um, going back to that question, it's really, you know, having the right people in our industry to help make your process smooth and easy photography, videography, and marketing. Um, these are elements that we bring to the table as far as getting your house sold. And again, most importantly, build that relationship with you on an intimate level. Uh, because if we have a relationship with you, there's a trust factor and the trust factor is there. And then we're on the same page the whole ride through. And, and that is so important. That's right. Yeah. Listen, I think you're doing great, mate. And uh, I love the whole branding thing. You're building a team and, you know, you have the complete support of Dorit and me and everything you do. Thank you, thank you, so you know, much. you're pushing your luck with this <laughs> podcast, but, <laughs> but, I, but I'm still on. I'm still on. I love it. I love it. Uh, One more question you... for PK. Yeah. Um, the Lady Miss X asks, um, do you have any tips for networking? Networking in business, socially, I guess. I think I, 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 they didn't I, really specify. You know, it's such a strange work, uh, such a strange word, networking, because um, it covers just a whole host of things. So I guess these days when the youngsters uh, 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 want to become entrepreneurs and they want to build up their um, contact base, they tend to do it on social media as opposed to in person. Whereas I grew up and had to do it in person. You know, when I used to meet people, I had to rely on my instinct, not what I read about them on Wikipedia, which is all made up, or Google, which, you know, carries all sorts of nonsense. So you have to rely on your instinct. So I, I would say the best way to network is to get out and actually meet people. I know it's been tough with COVID, but now hopefully we're through 
the worst of that, getting out, going to places where you know like-minded people are going to hang out. So, um, you know, be it restaurants, bars, clubs, you know, sports. I sound very old-fashioned here. No, you know, there but, is but the bottom line is you've got to get out and meet someone and you can't make it all about... You need to invest in what you're being told and you need to create relationships through having a genuine interest in what that person is telling you versus, oh, I just need to be friendly with that person because he might be able to help me. Because bright people can see through that. 100%. So networking, I don't even like the term networking. I, I prefer the term going to make friends, going to make contacts. But my, my, I don't know how old the person who asked me that question. It's also going to change. My advice will change depending on how old you are. Because I'm not going to restaurants specifically to go and meet people unless I'm single, which I'm not. So I think, I think the answer is try and make it more physically interactive. Try and actually meet them. Try not to read about people. Try and form your own opinion and let your instinct guide you as opposed to what you're reading or what someone else is telling you. You know, some of the best friends I've ever made and the best contacts I've ever made and the best deals I've ever made were being able to follow my heart and my instinct. And some of the biggest mistakes I ever made were not being able to do that and listening to voices, noise. Everybody's got opinions. Do you know what I mean? Us as a family now, the Kemsleys, we keep our circle incredibly tight. We have to, obviously, for obvious reasons, but we're a tight, tight circle. And we don't, you know, I'm always interested in hearing people's opinions when they're based on intelligence and they're well thought up. And I've invited them. I don't want to hear someone's opinions that I haven't asked for. They're not particularly intelligent. <laughs> Right. Do you know what I mean? They're no, not well no thought add, out. No added value. Sorry, no added value. So that would be a long-winded answer to that question, my love. I, I definitely will just touch on that. And you, and again, it's definitely trusting your gut, looking at people in the eyes, building that relationship with them. It definitely goes a long way across the board. Um, because if they can feel what you're talking about, you definitely connect with them. And yeah. that is why you're so successful. And trust. You, you've got to, particularly in your business, when you're dealing with like the most traumatic thing, outside of death and divorce is moving house. You know, those they say are the three most traumatic things a person Every can go through. Every one of our clients will tell you the same. This is the most stressful thing they've ever done. It's like getting outside of death, you know, getting married, having children, right? And then you have that buying and selling a house kind of thing. And the amount of emotion and it's financial, it's personal, it's emotional. And there's so much involved in it. And that's why it's so important. Like you mentioned is building that relationship with the client. And let, ha, hopefully the client will always listen and trust you to have the best. Listen, one other piece of advice I want to give as general property advice is if you're ever going to put yourself under pressure for anything in your life, do it for real estate. That is the best advice I can give you. If, if, if a house is $500,000, but you only wanted to spend $400,000, if there is a way of doing it, do it because it moves you up the ladder providing you're buying at the right price. Certainly in my life, whenever I, I bought a home, and you're talking about a guy that's owned a lot of homes. So I used to always push myself. I can remember the first house I ever bought. It was 106,000 pounds. I had to borrow 11,000 from my then father-in-law. I had a mortgage of 95,000. The interest rate, believe it or not, in those days was 15%. It was 1991. 15%. So you couldn't pay that. It was too much. So you had to defer the interest. And the interest got deferred and put on top of interest, on top of interest. Three years later, I've got a mortgage of 106000 and a house that's worth 85000 However, it changed again. And eventually, I got out of that. And the next deal I did was 250000 And that was far too expensive for me. And I, by hook or by crook, I pushed myself. And that went up. That house went up. And that was how I got on the ladder. But I got on the ladder. You can't stay in real estate. You can't say stay in a super safe zone unless you're older and you can't make the money. But if you're young and you know how to make money and you've got a good job and you think you're good at what you do and you've got good prospects, push yourself in real estate. Don't push yourself buying a fancy car. Don't push yourself buying a fancy watch. Watch. Right. Push yourself on real estate, on buying that house, that apartment. You'll make that money. You'll... 
you're, you know, my father back in the day, I just want to touch my father for one second. I remember the first thing I wanted to buy a car when I came out of college. Mm. And he says, no, 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 buy a condo. And I didn't listen. I wish I would have bought the condo because I would have made a lot more money in a condo because you don't make any money in a car. No, I make no money on cars. My dad, same thing. I, my first ever Porsche was in 1995. And my dad said to me, son, you know, rough rule of thumb, son, your car shouldn't be more than 20% of the value of your house. <laughs> My car was like 160% of the value of my house. <laughs> right. So when I give this advice, I'm giving it from a real place of knowledge, experience. Do you know what I mean? And I have one thing that I have a lot of is experience, you know, particularly in the real estate. A lot of common sense. Well, common sense goes a long way in this business. Yeah, I think being street savvy and street wise, you, you can't learn what I've learned in my life by reading a book. Right. You can learn from other people. You know, that might be something for you to consider doing is writing a book. Yeah, well, they say that. One day, uh, one day we'll do a book. One day we'll do a book. I've got to wait. Yeah. Well, too many secrets, man. <laughs> too many secrets. Everybody, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. So sorry we had so many blips and blaps and messes up with the uh, Instagram. Thank you, Instagram, for following Facebook. Twitch, Twitter, not Twitter, but everybody watching You're over very here. very good on camera, David. You think so? Very handsome. <laughs> very handsome. I want to thank you all for joining us here today. It's been a pleasure to have you. Keith, thank you so much. You're welcome. In the hardest of time, you came and you joined me today. Hey, buddy. Let, to bring let, no, you smiles. came. You came all the way from the East Coast to comfort your sister and me and the kids. We've loved having you. And of course, I'm happy to be on your podcast. Thank you. And support anything you do. I appreciate it so much. May I, quickly, yeah. may I quickly show us the uh, show everyone where else they could keep in touch with us? Yes, please go and show that to them now if you would. And then we're going to end with one more thing, guys. As you know, at the end of every show, we give a free tumbler away to the lucky winner on the wheel that's getting around and around. And we love giving them away. Please be in touch with us through all our social media outlets. We look forward to being in touch with you. Ever, and you ever need anything at all, please do not hesitate to reach out. We're here for you and we appreciate the opportunity to work for you every day uh let's go to the wheel at spins around and let's see who's gonna be the lucky winner today so we have a tumbler that we get out uh as a gift for everybody it's great for alcohol water juice oh, i didn't coffee. even know what what you call a tumbler and who's on the wheel who's on the wheel there's yeah, he's going to put a wheel that he spins around to a thousand people on there. Yeah, we got, I had, I spent 20 minutes adding all the followers that we got today onto Any, the wheel. That's still not all of them. Anybody, what happens, you, you, if you join our social media outlets, we put you on the wheel, you have a chance to win every week, and we send that one to your home. Lovely. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So uh, let's hit that spinning wheel. Let's see who the lucky winner is. That's, uh, I want to thank you for uh, being a comic relief on this episode. So that's exhausting. I usually do that. Tia Mola. Mola is Tia our Mola. winner today. She is a realtor on Instagram. Awesome. Amazing. So let me reach out to her after the show. That's awesome. Tia, congratulations. Eric, can you repeat back what you said because we couldn't hear with the No, story. I wanted to thank no, I wanted to thank PK for being the comic relief on the show because it's usually my role and it's exhausting. Yeah, well, <laughs> listen, having spoken to you, Eric, thank God you have me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you so much, so much for joining us. We love you. We appreciate you and look forward to taking the best care of you. And uh, thank you again, PK. Thank you, buddy. Talk to you guys soon. Bye.